Hello and welcome to our session today. Thank you for joining us to learn about what we think are three new game changers for getting evidence and experience into family planning and reproductive health programs. My name is Ruwaida Salem and I'm with the Knowledge Success Project, which is a USAID funded project that is led by the Johns Hopkins Center for Communication Programs with a consortium of partners, including AMREF Health Africa, the Busara Center for Behavioral Economics, and FHI 360. I just wanted to go over a few housekeeping items before we start. Uh, we are providing live French and English interpretation during this session. Our speakers will be speaking in English, but um, we will have an opportunity to have a Q&A discussion at the end of our session. And so participants will also be able to ask questions or make comments in French, and we'll interpret those into English. So everyone should take a moment right now to select whether you would like to listen in French or English. Um, so at the bottom of your Zoom screen, you'll see an interpretation icon. Um, and so you should select your language of choice. Um, because we are providing live interpretation, you may notice that we are speaking a little slowly and pausing before we transition to the next slide. So this is a chance to give our interpreters a chance to catch up with us. Uh, we also would like to let you know that we're going to drop a link to a Google Doc in the chat. So if you'd like to receive updates from the Knowledge Success Project, please feel free to add your name and email address to the Google Doc um, and we'll uh, sign you up for our distribution list. So now I'd like to take a moment to introduce our panel of speakers. Again, my name is Ruwaida Salem. I'm with the Johns Hopkins uh, Center for Communication Programs. Um, I'm joined today with several of my college, colleagues from the Knowledge Success Project, including Elizabeth Tully, Sophie Wiener, and Lisa Mwekambo. Together, we've been working on designing, developing, and launching three new innovations to help family planning professionals find, share, and use information in their work. And we're really excited to be here today to share those with you and also to get your feedback on them. So here's the plan for our session today. I'll start with um, a brief overview about knowledge management or KM, just to make sure that we're all starting from the same point. And then I'll provide an overview of what we learned from family planning professionals themselves about the key barriers and opportunities for speeding adoption of evidence and best practices in their programs. I'll then ask my colleagues to provide an overview of the three knowledge solutions that will address those barriers and opportunities. Now, we, we did have at one point um, had said that we would do breakout rooms, but since the number of participants are um, a little bit low, we actually will have the opportunity to have you listen to all three new um, knowledge innovations. So we won't have breakout rooms. We'll stay here in the main session. And then at the end of our session, we'll have time for everyone to have an open discussion and answer any questions that you might have. Um, if you have questions or comments before then, please feel free to use the chat throughout the session. And um, we'll be sure to leave some time at the end for people to unmute themselves if they'd like to ask their question out loud. So let's get started. Um, what is knowledge management? So our work at Knowledge Success focuses on KM. Our objective is, in to, is to ensure that people working in family planning and reproductive health programs can find, share, and use the knowledge they need to inform their work. And unlike other family planning projects whose audiences are the clients themselves, in our case, our audiences are actually the program managers and technical advisors who are planning and implementing and managing family planning programs. So many of you joining us today are in fact our audiences. At Knowledge Success, we define KM as a systematic process of both collecting knowledge and connecting people to it. 
We believe that knowledge is one of our most valuable assets to address global health challenges. What we know impacts how we take action and how we manage knowledge can affect individuals, it can affect programs, and ultimately even health systems. In the family planning sector, knowledge management can also improve coordination and enhance meaningful learning among health professionals. And the ultimate goal, of course, is to lead to improved health outcomes among our clients. So many of us practice CAM every day without even realizing it. So this is why I find um, this illustration to be a helpful um, tool to break down on a very practical level what knowledge management looks and feels like because it relates the different CAM tools and techniques that you probably are already using in your work to a certain extent. So on the matrix, it shows how CAM tools and techniques fall on a continuum from collecting information to connecting people to that information, as well as tools that push information to people and provide them with the tools so that they can pull the information themselves. So this creates four quadrants of different CAM tools and techniques that can be used to help people get the information they need to do their work effectively. So it ranges from ones that involve more human interaction that connect people together, things like conferences, like what we're doing today, um, to more specialized KM techniques like peer assists. Um, and it also ranges on the bottom half of the matrix to tools that um, are useful for sharing codifiable knowledge with large groups of people. So things like publications and websites. Another reason why I like this illustration is that it's also a good reminder that KM doesn't always have to be a technological solution. So what we often hear from people is, oh yeah, KM is all about building a database or a website. And yes, to, um, that is what KM encompasses to a large extent, but it also encompasses a wide range of activities that connect people together. Because at its core, KM is about people. Knowledge is created, captured, and shared through human interaction. So last year, our project set out to build lasting, game-changing KM solutions for family planning and reproductive health, taking into account all of these tools that were available to us in our KM toolbox. But we asked ourselves, how do we ensure that the KM solutions that we develop would be sustainable and picked up by a wide audience? So we decided we needed to start with a game-changing foundation and we chose to apply behavioral science and design thinking to our KM work. We thought that by understanding the behavioral drivers to performing knowledge management practices, and that by solving challenges together with our audiences, we could make KM relevant, easy, attractive, and timely, so that people actually do it and that programs benefit as a result. So between April and June of last year, we conducted four regional co-creation workshops in Africa, Asia, and the US. And we walked participants through the five stages of design thinking process, from empathizing and defining the problem to generating ideas and solutions and prototyping and testing those solutions. In total, we had 69 family planning professionals from 21 countries participate in our workshops. And the workshops produce several outputs, including a deep understanding of the challenges and opportunities that family planning professionals face when trying to access and use knowledge, as well as um, 14 specific prototypes of KM solutions to address those challenges and opportunities. So what did we learn? Um, what are some of the barriers to family planning professionals not fully engaging in the cycle of knowledge management. Some of the key barriers are what's called choice overload and cognitive overload. So these are behavioral economics terms to describe certain concepts. Choice overload is when you're presented with too many choices and that can lead to undesired outcomes like frustration and even inaction. Family planning professionals reported that while greater access to the internet and technology has given them better access to information, the sheer number of different information sources that exist can create feelings of being overwhelmed, especially because there's no easy way for them to sift through all of that information. 
This, of course, is um, made more challenging by the fact that most health professionals are very busy and have little time to devote to robust information seeking processes. A related barrier is that of cognitive overload. Cognitive overload is when too much information is presented in a way that's hard to understand. And so this makes it difficult for people to process and apply that information. Family planning professionals reported that they need actionable information that they can apply directly in their programs. But what they find is that information is not contextualized or specific enough for their work. Um, they also indicated that there's a lack of information about what works in family planning with details on the how of implementation, as well as information about what doesn't work in family planning. So it's not all bad news. There are some silver linings that we would like to point out. Um, one set of opportunities that the family planning professionals in our workshops identified fall into the category of organizational or social norms around information sharing. In particular, we found that there is a strong information sharing culture among organizations. Um, Family planning professionals specifically called out the importance of collaborations and partnerships to facilitate transparent and timely dialogue. So for example, they noted that when people come together in technical working groups, they often use that space to share more openly about what's working and not working in their programs. Um, the recent emphasis on democratizing information also came up frequently in our workshops and this provides an opportunity to include new voices in the discussion. The other category of opportunities in knowledge management relate to the incentives that drive people to share and use information. So in general, what we heard was that family planning professionals have an inherent desire to share their knowledge with their peers and colleagues because they want to help other colleagues improve their programs and improve the family planning field in general. And when they share that information, it um, creates like a reciprocal action. So other people also want to share information with them. And so this fosters collaboration and learning from each other. Also recognition for that sharing helps further encourage that positive behavior. So with these barriers and opportunities in mind, what kinds of KM solutions can we start to envision? The ultimate goal in KM is to bridge the knowledge to action gap and strengthen the use of information to improve family planning programs. So in our co-creation workshops, we generated hundreds of ideas of how we can get to this solution, you know, bridging that knowledge to action gap. When we looked across all of these ideas, we were able to group them into three large categories. First, there were knowledge management solutions that collect and document family planning information. So that synthesize and organize that information so it's easier to understand and use. So for example, several prototypes that were created in our workshops centered around creating a dynamic online hub that would collect and curate this important information in one place for easy access. The second category centered around solutions that connect people to the knowledge they need and also to each other so that they can share and exchange information in transparent ways. Um, these encompass both virtual and face-to-face -face, uh, aspects. And finally, the third category focused on solutions that um, focus on capacity strengthening or mentorship opportunities so that family planning professionals can learn from each other and grow their skill sets. So from these workshops, um, the Knowledge Success Project synthesized all of the insights and we continued to iterate on the prototypes and solutions that were developed. And at the end of the day, we came up with three new KM innovations that we have either recently launched or will be launching in the coming weeks. So now I'm going to ask my colleagues to first provide a brief overview on each of these innovations, and then we'll take a deeper dive into each of them. So first I'll ask Lisa to tell us about the pitch. 
Thanks, Rueda. Um, so before we show you a brief trailer um, about the pitch, I just wanted to give you some background as to the purpose. So the aim really was to find, fund, and support organizations that are passionate about knowledge management for family planning and reproductive health, and to champion their local CAM solution. So in doing so, um, the pitch really empowers local stakeholders to share their own CAM solutions for FPRH, um, issues that address local priorities, strengthens capacity in um, knowledge management, and increases awareness of FPRH professionals about the importance of CAM. So the overall goal is to create a network of CAM champions and innovators throughout Sub-Saharan Africa and Asia in order to strengthen knowledge exchange and collaboration in support of family planning and reproductive health programs. Now I'd like to share that um, trailer. This is The Pitch, a continental competition looking for the next knowledge management innovation in family planning and reproductive health. From over 80 applications from around the world, five were chosen as semi-finalists from Africa. I can team up with fellow young people to become key drivers in improving modern contraceptive rates in Nigeria. This will be a very great achievement for Malawi as a country. Family planning stakeholders across the country will be having access to family planning data. Winning this would actually make it possible to implement locally driven interventions. And that's super exciting because we know how much benefit it brings. It will really be very amazing, an amazing opportunity to be able to let people have easy access to reproductive health information and services. Ce travail là, une fois financé, que nous puissions en tout cas faire de bons résultats, ces résultats puissent servir à à toute l'Afrique francophone. A total of two winners will be selected as our KM champion innovators. Determining who will win an award of up to fifty thousand U.S. dollars. Let's meet our six experts judges. Rodeo Diallo, Dr. Joanne Peter, Mewita Budahastana, Kai Machunga, Dr. Tara Sullivan, and Anthony Daly. The stakes are high. Who has what it takes to be one of the next KM Champion Innovators? Thank you, Rueda. So during our deep dive, we'll share more about um, the pitch competition, some of the exciting, unique aspects of it, as well as some of our lessons learned from um, hosting it, um, basically from January until um, the end of March and where we're at right now. So um, looking forward to the discussion and sharing more. Um, over to Liz to share about FP Insight. Thanks, Lisa. And I say you're ready for prime time. That was such an exciting video. Um, so participants across all of the co-creation workshops expressed a desire for an online hub, somewhere to find relevant resources, save those resources, and then easily come back to them at any time. One of the co-creation groups specifically designed a prototype for a new platform inspired by Pinterest to provide a personalized space for family planning and reproductive health professionals to save, discover, and share resources they feel are significant, relevant, and timely for their work. From this idea, we developed the first resource discovery and curation tool. No, 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 no. Did you read my words already? The joys of working from home. <laughs> You just I it. apologize for that. Um, no problem, Liz. <laughs> so it's the first resource discovery and curation tool built by and for family planning and reproductive health professionals. And that's what we're calling FP Insight. It serves as the one place for all your favorite resources related to family planning and reproductive health. It provides a personali personalized news feed on collections and posts related to your particular interests. It includes a browser button to save posts even faster as you find relevant resources online. And it allows for offline saving and viewing um, when you don't have access to internet. So with that, Rueda, if you could play our FP Insight introductory video. Sure.
So if you go to that URL, you'll see that we're not quite in business yet. Um, but we will, um, after Sophie gives her overview, um, we will be going through each of these solutions and you'll get a sneak peek to what this uh, website is looking like at this moment. So with that, over to you, Sophie. Thanks, Liz. Um, so a pain point we frequently hear from our audiences is that family planning program best practices are not always comprehensively documented, contextualized, or packaged in a way that is easy to use. Um, so we developed Learning Circles as a way to address this need for detailed tacit knowledge and experiences around what works and what doesn't work in, in program implementation. So our goal with Learning Circles is to create spaces for people to share and receive detailed learnings in a, in a context that's appropriate for their work and programs. Um, we want to provide participants with the tools and skills to then actually go and apply those new learnings around family planning um, programming. We want to improve uh, family planning pr programs in a fun and, and meaningful way um, by modeling um, interactive and effective knowledge management practices. And ultimately, we hope to foster among FPRH professionals really um, immediate solutions that they need to solve urgent issues in their programs. So applications for our first regional cohort, which is for English speaking um, professionals based in Sub-Saharan Africa have just closed and we received over 200 applications to participate, which um, proves this, um, there's a high demand for this sort of experience. Um, so this cohort will take place from May to July of this year. And the topic that participants will be exploring is family planning in the context of COVID-19. Um, so now let's watch um, a short video to get more of an overview of learning circles. So during the learning circles portion of today's session, um, we'll do a little demo of one of the knowledge management techniques um, that we'll be using in learning circles. Um, and now I'll pass it back to Ruida. Great, <clears throat> thanks Sophie. So we'll do, um, like I said earlier, we were planning on doing breakout rooms since we're a relatively small group, we're gonna stay in the main room and we'll just all learn together a little bit more details about each of the solutions. 
So we'll start first with um, Lisa and the pitch. Thanks, Rueda. Um, if you don't mind moving to the next slide. So as Rueda mentioned, the importance um, that the co-creation found of having really localized solutions and a platform for those local solutions to really be amplified and better access, not only within those national contexts, but also to elevate the entrepreneurship, if you will, of those innovators was really important, as was making sure that there are opportunities for um, more capacity strengthening around CAM. So the pitch has really served um, this purpose. And one of our champions, um, Dr. Um, Chandra Moli, he shared with us why he in particular thought the pitch was a really great idea and in light of COVID-19 in particular. So um, he said during an interview, one of the things that COVID-19 has taught us is that the best responses do not come from the richest countries. The best experiences came from unlikely heroes of public health from Vietnam, Uruguay, or South Africa. A competition like this, which pays attention to and respects learning from the ground really excites me. And I think that really is the way to go. So with this kind of excitement and momentum behind this innovation, we also found um, that there was a lot of excitement um, for this, and we'll share more as the video did um, a, lot, a bit about those 80 applicants. So next slide. But before we do that, we just wanted to kind of explain how the actual um, competition worked. So we had a launch event where we um, um, announced the call for applications, really went over the guidelines, answered any questions the applicants would have, talked about what the eligibility criteria was and whatnot. Then the next step really was reviewing those applications against an established rubric to identify five semi-finalists from Sub-Saharan Africa and then also Asia respectively to invite them to make a pitch. So those um, invited 10 in total um, received training and guidance on how to make and prepare a five minute pitch to an esteemed um, panel of colleagues or judges and colleagues within the family planning and reproductive health space, but really represent the donor community for the most part. Then we recorded, pre-recorded the five minute pitches with each um, semi-finalist. And we held um, kind of a coaching session with the judges to go over what the plans were for the actual competition meetings, um, what the scorecards would be for them, as well as provided um, a brief uh, training on overcoming implicit bias and um, kind of how they should keep their mind open to the pitch ideas that were coming from the different um, semifinalists. Then we hosted uh, Africa specific um, closed um, pitch meeting, which was recorded via Zoom in which semi-finalists got an individual five minutes with the um, panel of judges to give their pitch or make their pitch. And then they had an additional eight minutes to kind of answer any Q and A. And then we did the same thing with the Asia semi-finalists. And at the end of kind of both of those um, meetings, the semifinalists all left after they made their respective pitch, our judges deliberated and decided on the two selected winners. Um, as you saw in the trailer, we've developed um, basically TV-like episodes of the pitch. Um, one of the shows that um, inspired us was Shark Tank or as you can think of, there's a lot of baking competition shows. So we were trying to get that um, feel um, from this uh, innovation. And our plan is to announce the winners um, via YouTube watch parties later in May. And we welcome you all to attend that and kind of learn with the semi-finalists as to who the winners are for their um, sub awards of up to $50,000. And then um, each of the winners will have a five month period to implement. And at that time, they'll be receiving kind of ongoing support, coaching support from um, knowledge success related to um, knowledge management capacity building. Next slide. Oh, sorry. Okay. So um, in case you're wondering, um, in terms of eligibility, 
we were really looking at organizations, so not individuals, but organizations um, that are located in USAID family planning and reproductive health priority countries in um, Africa and Asia. Um, we gave priority to national and local organizations, but also um, international organizations could apply as long as they were legally registered and showed proof of registration um, in country and had a registered um, local bank account. Um, of course, all organizations um, had to adhere um, by the um, United States government's family planning and development policies. And they had to propose a very clear um, KM solution to a KM challenge um, that is faced in their respective FPRH communities. Next slide. So as the trailer showed, um, we had 80 applicants, and this just shows the breakdown between um, the Africa versus Asia. So we had really good representation across the USAID priority countries. Um, and we, even though we provided the criteria um, up front, we did receive applicants from beyond um, kind of the USAID priority countries as well um, in terms of interest. And then um, from those applications, we were able to come to a consensus um, after our first round of review um, that was done internally by um, Knowledge Success uh, staff, but representing different functions and portfolios of the um, of the project to identify the five um, from each Africa and Asia to be invited to make their pitch. Next slide. So um, this is the list of the semifinalists that were invited. We had a pretty good range of um, geographic distribution within um, Sub-Saharan Africa as well as Asia. And you can find the full um, kind of summary write-ups or blurbs about each of their um, solutions on the knowledgesuccess.org website if you go to the URL on the screen. But just one kind of cool fact to note is that at least five of the organizations that um, were invited as semi-finalists represent youth-led organizations, while um, just three um, represent kind of the independent registered offices of um, international NGOs. So we were really excited to see that distribution and really that we had local and national organizational representation. Next slide. So um, in terms of what the pitch consisted of, um, in terms of how the different semifinalists structured their um, ideas and solutions, really the pitch answered the questions on this slide. So they provided background context, um, what the problem they sought to address was, um, the solution and what was unique about it and some of the key features and elements the cost and specifically what the bulk of that cost was going towards um, so that we could clearly understand um, issues around sustainability um, and how it would advance the field um, of family planning and reproductive health and its potential impact as well as its plans to ensure sustainability given that we know that this is just a five month period for implementation. So in addition to kind of receiving training um, on how to, how to structure a pitch to kind of address those questions, we also made sure that the training included um, persuasive communication styles and introduced the uh, semifinalists to Monroe's motivated sequence framework um, to make sure that everyone kind of had the same structural motif, even if they decided to kind of take a different angle in how they um, communicated that pitch or delivered it. Um, and we made sure to uh, provide feedback along the way related to their storyboards, as well as during the um, actual pre-recording. Next slide. So as the trailer um, introduced our judges, I won't go into great detail, um, but essentially um, our judges were selected so that they represented really the um, geographies in which we sought solutions, um, also gave range to a variety of different donors, even though Knowledge Success is funded by USAID. 
we knew in the end that the competition would only fund two winners per um, region. So we thought it'd be um, motivating and an incentive that our semifinalists would have the opportunity to have a wider platform, even if they didn't win, to um, a broad selection of um, donors to get their ideas out there. So um, Mewita Buddha Harsana um, was a key judge, especially for the Asia competition region, has a long history and background in family planning, reproductive health research, and formerly had worked for the Ford Foundation. Um, both Rodeo Diallo and Anthony Daly represent Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Um, Rodeo based in the Nigeria office and Anthony based in the India office and they both oversee um, aspects of the family health portfolios there. Clive Matunga um, is a great um, CAM champion and family planning champion representing the PHE portfolio um, at USAID headquarters. Um, Joanne Peter, she's um, part of jo Johnson & Johnson's Global Community Impact, um, kind of like a social corporate responsibility arm, um, and has a great um, interest specifically in digital health solutions, and then our very own project director, Tara Sullivan. Next slide. So the judges, um, as I mentioned, we had a pre-pitch um, meeting with the judges to really talk about um, scoring and how that would go. We tried to make it as simple as possible. As you can imagine, the time for these competition meetings was quite tight. Um, so with each um, semifinalist getting about 13 minutes to um, speak, or five minutes for their pitch, eight minutes for Q&A, um, we really had to do the scoring as the, the pitches were being delivered. The judges were given all of the um, pitch storyboards, if you will, or scripts in advance in case they wanted to review those and take notes to come prepared, which all of our judges did, which was wonderful. Um, and then the, the score card was really set up in a Google spreadsheet that looked at solutions fit to need. Um, we looked at feasibility and then potential for um, sustainability. Um, each of those categories basically had um, a note section where they can note and document kind of the pros and cons to inform their scores. And then they use the point system um, illustrated on the slide. So I'll quickly kind of explain what kind of encompassed these um, categories. So in terms of solution fits need, we looked at, you know, does the solution clearly address an FPRH challenge? Does it fit the challenge described? And what is the added innovation if this is an older existing idea? Um, and as I mentioned, the judges all had an opportunity to kind of further deep dive um, around those questions if they didn't feel like the pre-recorded pitch um, provided enough clarity um, in regards to these questions. Next slide. Feasibility is pretty straightforward. You know, given the interest of these being relatively like up to $50,000 and had to be implemented within a five month period, does that really seem realistic? And I think having um, a panel of judges who represented the donor community as well as um, previous experience and implementation, they had a very critical eye um, related to that um, category. And then potential for sustainability. Again, I think the judges came from a really good point of view um, related to that and having um, a lot of in-country experience and knowledge as to the context and therefore sometimes the um, complications um, in bureaucracies in place that needed to be considered, um, they were able to kind of further uh, dive into questions around partnerships and um, relationships with um, MOH um, to really strike at um, potential for sustainability. Next slide. So, what did we learn? So um, we learned that there's a ton of interest in competitions like this, that um, 
we gave about a four week window for the calls for applications. And we did receive, as I mentioned, 80. So that was really great to see. And people are very much interested in knowledge management and improving, um, connecting to knowledge and information, sharing knowledge and information, getting um, information in the hands to people that need it the most. Um, but as Rueda mentioned up front, um, some knowledge management um, professionals, their key end user audience is um, family plan clients. In um, knowledge success, that's not really the case. And so making also that distinguishing too between um, getting knowledge and information in the hands of people to like perform their jobs better versus getting information and knowledge to be able to be ch change their behaviors wasn't always clearly um, distinguished um, within some of the um, uh, applications. So more guidance and um, I think frame, better framing might need to be done um, in the future for such a competition. Um, it was really useful to have a very clear application format um, and I think what we learned with that is it's always good to have kind of word counts limits to help people kind of establish expectations that we weren't looking for proposals. However, I think in some cases, having that limit on the number of words or character counts meant that we didn't always get the level of detailed responses um, around the innovation that we wished for. Um, simple scorecards were key. Um, also, you know, a number of our judges also live and um, work uh, overseas where connectivity is sometimes an issue. So always relying on like Google Docs and spreadsheets um, wasn't always the best way to go. So providing offline versions was really important. Pre-recorded videos was really helpful in anticipation of the live pitch meetings between the semifinalists and the judges. We did run into kind of one to two connectivity issues that we could address by just um, not using video at the time. Um, so having some things pre-recorded helped. Um, so also during the pre-recording, we asked questions about like what it would mean to the semifinalists if they won, what it would mean to them individually, to their communities, to their organizations. And that's what you basically saw in the trailer. So we didn't have to go back to the semifinalist um, because as I mentioned, the winners are still kind of um, under wraps, if you will. So um, we wanted to keep that anticipation and excitement for all of us to find out together with the, um, at the YouTube premiere uh, um, watch parties. Of course, anything you do with um, Zoom or recording, having really good mics and uh, headsets is really important. And then there's lots of logistics as I'm sure um, our um, hosts of um, the GH Tech Exchange can tell you um, to really kick off and um, facilitate this kind of meeting virtually. But it was really, everything was practiced kind of well in advance and um, we lucked out, I suppose, but it worked out really well. So um, if you can go to the next slide, it's really to just remind you to kind of visit um, Knowledge Success website. Um, you can sign up um, on that um, URL link to get future uh, announcement for when our specific dates are for our YouTube um, premiere episodes where we'll be announcing um, the semifinalists. Also, if you go to that link, you can learn, like I said, about the 10 innovations and you can share with us um, which innovations you kind of think are the most exciting or hoping to be the winners. And you'll find out if you're right um, later in May. So thank you. Over to you, Liz. Thanks, Lisa. And um, I seem to be having some of my own connection issues uh, now, so I'm going to stay off video. Um, so FP Insight, I'm here to provide an overview um, of some of the key functions and actions um, that someone can take on FP Insight. Um, and just to note that we'd hoped to be at a place where we could be doing something like a scavenger hunt activity today, um, but we just aren't quite there yet. Um, 
I've included various screenshots throughout um, to show you, to give you a, you know, a sneak peek of what, of what it looks like. Um, but you should also note that we're doing some styling, um, some brightening up of the site. Um, so when we do launch, it will likely look a bit different. Um, next slide. Oh, I hid those slides. <laughs> I was going to do an icebreaker if we were. So if you go to the one with the little blue. Um, yeah, thank you. OK, so first um, we have uh, users can or um, visitors can come to FP Insight and get a, a little bit of a taste of what the what the site is. But in order to get full functionality, um, you people are encouraged to become a, like a registered account holder on FP Insight, that's a free account. Um, and once they do, they can create and curate their own collections of posts on family planning and reproductive health topics that are important to them. Um, and, and a person can create numerous collections based on their interests. They're not tied to just one collection. They can really you know, create as many as, as um, is appropriate or they see fit. Next slide. So here's one of our screenshots. Um, and I just wanted to show how you know easy it is um, to create a new collection. This is within my own profile page. Um, and this is where one of the ways that I could create a collection. Um, so next slide. So to start curating a collection once it has been created. A person adds the resources that are important to them, things that are online um, that they find on across various websites um, and putting it into one central place on FP Insight. So in order to do this, it can be done a couple of different ways. First, you can pull from a website um, that you regularly use. And for, a, for example, on a shameless plug, if you wanted to post this knowledge success article that's sort of on the, the background of the left side, um, and you wanted to post this knowledge success article to a collection, you would copy the URL of that page. And then on FP Insight, you would click the yellow circle with this plus sign, I've circled it with the green. Um, and then from there, you just paste the URL and the platform automatically pulls in the metadata of that page such as the title, the description, and an image if there is one. You as the, the poster of that uh, article can then add relevant tags to this post. So it can be found, other people can find it through those tags. Um, and we also have a field where you can explain why you like that resource. What, why is it important to you? And this helps contextualize it for others on FP Insight. Like, I used this for a virtual meeting I was hosting. Um, and then someone, if they were looking for something like that, could be like, oh, let me go check out that resource. This really helped that person um, plan that meeting. So then on the right hand side, you can, the other option is when you are um, perusing FP Insight and discover what others are posting, you can save interesting posts that are relevant to your um, areas of focus to your collection. So if I was scanning and found a resource that one of you or one of my colleagues had posted, I can um, click the save button and save it then to my own collection. That makes it very easy for me to find it later when I need it. Um, and then after you've saved the post, it will display in the feeds of other people that have similar interests to you. So we have feeds that sort of bring in those sort of, um, it's like dynamic feeds that bring in uh, your interests at, that you've indicated in your platform or in your profile. So if any of you use Pinterest, you'll find that this uh, functionality is similar to that platform. Next slide. Another key function on the site, as I mentioned, are the feeds. Um, so each person will have three, a trending feed, a following feed, and a for you feed. Um, and these help you to discover what others are posting on FP Insight. 
Next slide. The trending feed displays uh, individual posts or collections. Um, so the posts are what makes up collections. Um, so collections is sort of the overarching um, thing and then the posts feed into the collections. So this feed shows the most popular. So as is the case with other social media profiles, users interact with posts and collections. They can like them, they can follow them and they can save them. So the more interaction um, an, an item receives, the more likely it will appear on the trending page. Next slide. So the following feed displays the content of the collections or of the people that you've selected to follow. So you're able to follow um, overarching collections and you, then you can also follow your you know, other people that you find on the site that have similar interests to you. So for example, if um, you're curating a collection on self-care or if one of you, excuse me, is uh, curating a collection on self-care, I could follow that collection and then see updates as you add more resources to it in my following feed. You can also choose to follow another account holder. Again, if when this site launches and any one of you participants joins, um, I could follow one of you and this feed would show me content that you are posting as an individual. Next slide. The For You feed displays collections and individual posts related to your interests. So when you become an account holder on FP Insight, we recommend that you build out your profile information, including your designation, a short bio, and your interests. This information will help others not only understand who you are and what your interests are, because they will be able to come and see your profile, but there more importantly, it will help to build a tailored experience in your For You feed. Next slide. So the platform can be used on your computer or your mobile device. And while it isn't a traditional phone app, you can add the platform to your mobile's home screen for easier access outside of your you know, traditional web browser. We also have a browser button um, that will make it very easy as you're visiting another website to just click on that button if you have it installed and it will quickly save um, those posts to FP Insight. Um, so look out for that when you join the site. Next slide. And I've already touched some on saving posts, but I wanted to call particular attention to why it's important. Um, as we heard in the co-creation workshops, these particip those participants wanted somewhere to find relevant resources, save them, and then easily come back to them at any time. So not trying to remember, oh, where did I put that? Um, is that in my bookmarks? Is that in my email? So our aim is that FP Insight is a time saver and that it also helps you discover what other family planning and reproductive health professionals are finding and saving. The site also has the ability to save resources to the local device that you're on. So someone can come back and read it, even if they are offline. I do want to mention that users should not save everything for offline viewing, as it will save again to your local device and could have an impact on device storage if too many items are saved. So really we're recommending that offline content is periodically reviewed by the account holder to potentially remove items that are no longer needed for offline use. Next slide. So FP Insight will be soft launching in May with the full launch occurring in June. So once it is available to all, it's really easy to get started on the, on the platform. Next slide. While FP Insight visitors do not need an account holder or need an account in order to view some of the activity on the site, they will need one in order to perform most functions such as developing collections or, or really all functions, such as developing collections, posting resources, getting those customized feeds and interacting with other people's posts in the form of liking 
and saving. Next slide. And FPN Insight has the option of creating an account with an email or using one of your federated logins through an existing Google or Facebook account. Next slide. So again, um, we hope that you will join us on FP Insight when we launch in June. And thank you. I will turn it over to Sophie. Thanks, Liz. Okay, so um, Rowita, would you like me to share my screen? Thanks. Yes, we're gonna just switch screens really quickly. Okay, so um, in this part of the session, we'll be demoing a knowledge management technique called 15% solutions, um, which is an example of the type of exercise um, that is used in learning circles. And just a little disclaimer, since the conditions and timing of the session are a little different from the context of a learning circle session, it won't be exactly the same experience, but this will give you a good uh, sense of what it's like. Um, so what's great about 15% solutions is that when dealing with a really big challenge, this activity gets individuals and a group or team um, to really hone in on what is practically within their discretion instead of getting so overwhelmed by what they cannot control or change. Um, it encourages you to think about uh, just that 15% of the problem that is within your reach and you can address. Um, you can see where you have freedom to act and you can think about what you can do without any additional resources or more authority. Um, so here's how it works. Um, first, we'll take a quick poll to see what challenges, which challenge you as a group would like to tackle today. Um, then you'll take some time on your own to reflect on the challenge and brainstorm uh, your 15% ideas in a shared uh, Google slide deck, um, which we'll be sharing with you uh, the link to. Um, next will be the consultation time. Um, one person will present their favorite idea of all the ideas that they came up with. Um, and, and then the rest of the group will ask some clarifying questions, um, provide any extra advice uh, that person may want to consider. And then normally with this activity, each person would have a, uh, their own consultation time on their idea, but um, we'll see how much time we have. Um, and last, we'll end with some next steps towards implementing your ideas. Okay, so now let's vote on today's challenge. Um, we can either talk about one, how can you ensure efficient coordination between global health stakeholders? Two, how can you effectively integrate new knowledge management techniques into your work team? Um, three, how can we expand integration of family planning and reproductive health into other development programs. So take a couple seconds to think about your favorite choice and then please vote by typing the number of your choice. So one, two or three in the chat and we'll just do a quick count. So we have a vote for, oh, three, two, one. <laughs> two. Would anyone else like to cast their vote? Okay, so it looks like we'll go with number two. How can you effectively integrate new knowledge management techniques into your work team? Um, Okay, so now we'll do our individual brainstorm to come up with the ideas to solve our challenge. Um, and remember, each solution should be within your discretion, the resources you have and authority as an individual. So Rueda has um, shared the link to the Google slide. Um, it looks like a few of you have entered the slide. Is anyone having any trouble um, accessing the slides? Um, so then once you're in the slide deck, scroll down to slide six and pick one of the slides between six and um, 15 to work with. Um, and then add your name at the top of that slide to 
kind of claim it. And then um, you'll, you'll add your solution ideas to the challenge by double clicking on the text in the blue sticky note and then adding your idea there. Um, if you run out of sticky notes, you can copy and paste to add as many as you need. And let's just do three minutes to brainstorm. Does anyone have any questions before we start? I see Seb has claimed a slide. And Will, Tara. Oops. Okay, no problem, Karen. Okay, so I'll start the timer now. You have three minutes to add your ideas. And start. You have about 45 seconds left. Ten more seconds. Okay, time's up. Um, great job, everyone. It looks like you all came up with a lot of ideas. Um, so now we'll move on to the consultation. Um, so the consultation part, um, you'll have a chance to ask each other clarifying questions about your ideas and offer any advice you may have. Um, and if Rueda could please take notes in the consultation slides. Um, so in the slide deck, starting at, let's see, slide 14, um, you'll pick a slide um, and then you'll pick your just one idea of all the ideas that you came up with, 
um, and either retype that idea or copy and paste it um, into your consultation slide where it says paste your idea here. And then once everyone has added their um, one favorite idea to their consultation slide, I'll ask for a volunteer to um, share that idea with the group. Then the group will provide their consultation by asking any additional clarifying questions about the solution and offering their advice. So now please go ahead um, and find a consultation slide to claim as your own um, and add your top idea to the top part of the slide. Does anyone have any questions? Does that make sense? I see Lisa has found a slide. Good job. Seb. Okay, has everyone added their idea to their consultation slide? Does anyone need more time? Okay, so can I have a volunteer who would like to share their idea that they're, they're really proud of or, or they just want um, more consultation? Yes, Lisa, go ahead. So let's go into your slide. So I just mentioned the importance of integrating knowledge management into all job descriptions. So kind of um, broadening it from it, from people thinking about it is just certain people's jobs. And that could be done um, by, you know, including involvement in organizational communities of practice, the importance of updating intranets, um, the expectation of doing project documentation as well as like kind of slash com. So like when someone travels, like or is involved in any way in kind of an event to make sure that they also feel responsibility of doing maybe a blog post after the event. Um, so, yeah, that sounds like a great great idea. Yeah, does anyone have any any questions? Anything that you, any parts of the idea that you don't quite understand? And you can just unmute yourself. Um, if you'd like to speak. If there's no questions, I guess, Lisa, you did a really good job explaining. Um, does anyone have any advice? Any other things that you might want to, that Lisa might want to think about um, with this idea? Are there any aspects that um, she just might want to consider? I'll jump in. This is Tara. Can you hear me? Yes. Go ahead, Tara. Um, I just wanted to say maybe one thing to think about is how to tie the fact that it's in your job descriptions, perhaps to performance review. So it makes a link between what is expected, but also what's being measured, I guess, to a certain degree in terms of um, staff performance. That's a great piece of advice. Thank you, Tara. Does anyone else have any advice for Lisa's idea? Okay, um, I think we can maybe move on to just one more consultation. If, if someone else would like to share their idea. If not, we can just move on to the, the Q&A portion of, of today's session. Do we have one more volunteer? I can go if no one else wants to. Okay, let's find your slide. So mine's on slide 16. And I said, um, 
we could hold skill sessions or like mini workshops um, on how to implement new KM techniques. So I think sometimes we kind of get in a rut and we do the same old, same old because it's comfortable, it's what we're familiar with. Um, but if we demonstrate a new KM technique and show people how to use it, then it might open their eyes to something new. Um, it might give them a little more confidence that they, they could do the technique as well. Um, and, you know, maybe generate some ideas of, of when they might use that, that new KM technique. Yeah, that's a great idea. Does anyone have any questions? Or pieces of, of advice for Rueda to, con uh, to consider? I have, I have a, a oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, Tara. No, you go ahead, Will. Thank you. Um, I think maybe like from my perspective, I'd have to think through like how often you would hold these sessions. Like you'd want to create some momentum, but um, you don't want to hold them too frequently because it might bog people down. Um, I think this goes back to a question that was- I, I know at CCP, we often do these kinds of skill shots. Um, and they're really kind of short, like maybe I want to say 30 or 45 minutes. So it's not so um, burdensome on people. I think those tend to be pretty popular among our own organization. Great. Will, did you have something you wanted to share? I just have a, a really quick question. And I think it goes back to something that was asked on the previous slide. Um, but I was wondering about implementation and measuring that. I know that at my current organization, um, you know, we have a, a lot of workshops and talking about uh, new ideas uh, to reach audiences, but it kind of quickly falls into uh, old routines or just saying that we're doing it. And so I was just wondering if there had been a, a success story for how, you know, it was implemented and taken hold by staff and wasn't just words. That's a great question. Um, Will, it sounds like Rueda um, is having a hard time hearing participants. Um, do you think you could just quickly recap that in the chat for her to answer? Sure, of course. Hold on one second. No, sorry about that. I'm not hearing anyone else um, audio for some reason. Can you hear us as? Yeah, yeah, I can hear okay. the speakers, but I can't well, hear anyone else. <laughs> well, my understanding of what Will just shared was that in his organization, there's a lot of talk about new techniques and ideas, but is there any way of like measuring, like successfully measuring or seeing follow up to like, mm. say, if you do skills building training at something new, like as, are there successful examples of that actually being implemented? Mm -hmm. um, after that kind of discussion? Yeah, that's a, that's a really great question. And I feel like that's one of the challenges we always face with um, knowledge management in general is that um, it's a very practical, I'd say, field. And um, so people want to implement right away, but really to do KM systematically, um, you'd have to go through kind of a systematic process where you, you know, identify what the need is, find the solution to that need, implement it, and then also have some monitoring and evaluation, uh, you know, an m and &E component so that you can see what kind of results you're actually getting with those KM approaches. So yeah, I think it would be great if, um, you know, there's the, the motivation and the, um, the resources to put some monitoring behind it so that you could, you know, monitor how many times the, the approach was implemented, what kinds of, um, of, of results, you know, I think there are simple even KM techniques that can be used to help with that m &E, like after action reviews um, that could help identify that kind of monitoring information for people to find out if they're actually working and um, if they've had impact on their programs. So thank you for that, that good question. And and can I follow up with that too? I think some of that too is expectation setting up front. So if it's about an individual's capacity strengthening around a specific technique, say you attend a workshop 
Um, what are the expectations that your supervisor has or that your organization has for you upon return? Like, are you going to give a brown bag? Are you going to do some kind of demonstration of that? Are you going to provide some kind of cascade down? Um, so I think that relates to some of the other ideas that came out of um, this um, approach where a lot of people said demonstrating in team meetings or like, and I think Tara said something about like small wins, like talk the talk. So may set having leadership have those expectations. So that's just part of the culture. Yeah, no, that, those are all great ideas. I agree wholeheartedly with that. Does anyone else have any um, questions or advice for, for Rueda? I think the only thing that I would add, which Lisa kind of alluded to, is that in it, if you're doing it at an organization. I think we have about 10 minutes left in our session, so this might be a good time to. Oh, wait, um, Rueda, sorry, Tara was speaking. <laughs> oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. It's okay. Go ahead, Tara. <laughs> I can give signals. <laughs> I'll, I'll just quickly say that this relates to what I had put down as one of my ideas because I, I love, um, as part of some of the groups that I participate in and also as part of my organization, I think it's great to. Um, not only do these skill sessions, but after the skill session is over, either leadership or some KM champions within the organization can walk the talk, meaning that you start to integrate those tools and techniques into the work that you're doing on a more routine basis so that not only are you using it for the benefit of the organization, but you're modeling how to use it for others so that they can pick up the practice as well. That's great. Thanks. <laughs> Okay, since um, we don't have much time left, let's, um, I'll turn it back to, we can end this demo and I'll turn it over to Rueda. And I'll stop sharing my screen. Give me one second. And so we'll just um, open it up now for any Q and A or discussion. Um, if you, you know, have a question, feel free to unmute yourself. I can actually hear you now. I, I figured out I had an issue and I fixed it. Um, so feel free to unmute yourself, ask a question about any of the knowledge management solutions that we've talked about today, um, or, or if, um, going back to the earlier part of our presentation about the co-creation workshop insights, you know, around the KM challenges and barriers. Um, that family planning professionals experience. We'd love to hear from you what kinds of, um, you know, uh, approaches you use to address any of those uh, barriers, like the choice overload, the cognitive overload. How do you address those in your programs? Um, and have you seen other KM solutions that um, address them in, in innovative ways? Um, so feel free to, to ask any questions, um, respond to those questions. Um, and use the chat box as well. So I'll give just a few more seconds in case anyone has a question. Okay, well with that then, um, we can end a few minutes early. We really appreciate everyone taking some time to join us today. And we encourage everyone to visit knowledgesuccess.org. On our website, you can stay up to date on trending family planning news. You can learn more about our co-creation workshops and you can also sign up to receive updates when we launch our next knowledge management solution, which is um, FP Insight. So have a great day, everyone. And thank you again. Bye-bye.